Amen. All right, James chapter 5, verses 13 and through 15, and then next week will be our last one in James, and I'm deciding on what to do next. Um, I've got a couple ideas, don't know yet what I want to do, but still praying about that, about where to go next. But James 5, verses 13 through 15 is where we're going to be at this evening. Cancer, heart disease, something that's hit home in my family here in the last couple of years, Alzheimer's, uh, lupus, etc. You could go on and on and on with illnesses, um, things that are possibly uncurable that we have going on in our lives or people's lives that we know of. These all strike a chord a fear in our hearts when we hear them, especially if you go into a doctor's office and they relay to you the news that you have something going on in your life and it's going to take some time and you're going to have to have treatment or whatever it may be. And when we hear those words or people that we know of hear these words, it reminds us of one thing I, I believe is that how fragile life is and just how in the blink of an eye, things can happen so quickly. Um, oftentimes, it sends us into a tailspin, into panic mode. We're wondering, what do I do next? Uh, and sometimes we get in our mind, okay, I'm already jumping way ahead to the worst case scenario. <laughs> sometimes we even do that. Well, with this thought comes the question, though, why do healthy hearts sometimes wind down unexpectedly? Why do some people get medical conditions, but others don't? Why are some of the best people that you know confined to wheelchairs and walkers? And when we ask those questions, it once again reminds us that life is fragile and that one day death is going to come for all of us unless Jesus comes in the rapture to get the church. We will one day step out of this life into the next Because that's the vehicle that God chose for us. And that's the vehicle of death. Um, You have people that have these illnesses in life. And they'll be crippled. Or maybe they'll have this disease that they think is incurable. And oftentimes you have these what I call religious charlatans. That will want to try to get people to send their money in. Why do they want people to send their money in? Is because they will actually say, I have the power to heal you. It almost sounds like, you, I'm, I grew up in the 80s, so I'm, I know who He-Man is. He always said, I have the power. And he said, the power of Grayskull. But we think these individuals, they make the announcement, and they'll say, listen, I have the power to heal you. All you have to do is do this, do that. And the common denominator of all these individuals that claim that they have the power to heal someone is this little monetary, little amount of money that you have to send in. I remember, I don't know, somewhere in Lenore City, I used to see this television program that was on all the time. I don't even know if the church is still there or not. But it'd come on every night throughout the week. And the gentleman and his wife would get on there and they'd try to sell some water. If you buy this water and you drink it, you'll have the best life you can imagine. And you'll, you'll be fruitful and you'll be used of the Lord to drink this water. And I'm thinking, they're getting this water out of the same tap I'm getting it out of. What's the difference? <laughs> but why do people flock to these individuals? Why do people flock to a person named Benny Hint? Why do people flock to these individuals that claim that they can heal people. These individuals that are out there that say, listen, if you've got this illness, I can heal you. It's because people want something quick and they're easily deceived. And they want to pursue it because they think that there might be something there that can help them. But the big thing to remember is when someone puts a price tag on your healing, just remember this. God's healing is never for sale. There's not a price tag attached to that. See, we serve a God that can heal any 
sickness. I believe that. At any time, whenever he chooses, we have a God who can perform miracles. He's done it in the past. He's doing it now. And he will continue to do that. His miracles, however, are not what we think when we see these so-called preachers. I'm scared to think that if someone says, you come on down here and I guarantee a healing, they're going to be eating a lot of crow. Because if you walk out of there the same way you walked in, that guy is a phony. And pretty much all of them are that claim that they can do that. But here is the hardest part that we must swallow. And we've got to accept this. Why does God choose to heal some and not others? Why, is, why are some people healed, but then other people aren't? That's a hard, hard question that we have to ask ourselves. It's a difficult question that we have to answer ourselves. See, often in Scripture, we see people who are sick. Some survive their sickness, and some do not. For example... The Apostle Paul, to most theologians, had an eyesight problem, and three times he asked God to take that away. Three times he said, can I be healed of this? But God didn't. You know why? Because he told Paul that his grace is sufficient. Hmm. So here's the point. God can always heal, however, sometimes he chooses not to do so. And that's where a lot of people struggle. They struggle with that. They have a hard time accepting that. So here in our passage, I want us to see how we should respond when sickness comes and how we should respond if it never leaves. So let's read this passage together. It's just a few verses, and then we'll go and we'll um, talk about each one. Verse number uh, 13 here. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he had committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, first of all, I want us to look at this. I want us to look at sickness always depends on the plan of God. There is no sickness that can come into your life or mine without His approval. That's because God is in control. Now, He may not be the originator of the sickness, but He will allow it to come into your life if He wills it and if He allows it. Now, prior to verse number 13, we were talking about how that James gave us the explanation of suffering and then gives us the example of Job and the prophets and all that they went through and how God blessed those who go through difficult circumstances. And also in the same chapter, James describes Christians who were being persecuted in his day. So we have to be mindful of that, that in the early church, Christians didn't just have a bed of roses. They didn't have just the easiest of times. They faced harsh times, difficult times. That was very prominent in the early church. Now, all of these he mentions are going through difficult situations. And this is, this is good to understand, and this is good for us as we go forward here this evening, is that they were going through difficult situations even in the midst of being in the perfect will of God. They weren't living in disobedience. They were living in obedience to God. And all of this still was going on. So knowing this, verse number 13 there in the beginning says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. So if you're suffering, you ought to pray and recognize God's sovereign plan over your life. Is that God has control over all aspects of everything. He is in control of your life. He's in control of my life. And there isn't one sickness that can come into your body unless God allows it to. Now, knowing all sickness must pass through the will of God, I want us to look at why we have sickness to begin with. So we're going to look at that this evening. The first one is this. Some sickness comes because of our failures. It's not because of Satan. We can't blame Satan for our sickness. We can't blame God for our sickness. But oftentimes it's brought about 
by ourselves. Now, for an individual that was into drugs and drug abuse, and this person was into that a lot of their life, and let's say midway through their life or later on than that, they come to Christ and they get saved and they've turned away from that drug abuse. Now, that's great. I'm thankful for a life that has been forever changed. I praise God for that. But the effects of what they were in earlier in their life has done a toll on their body. They cannot get away from that. So those same circumstances, those same failures that they made in the drug abuse are going to play a big part in their life and may end it early because of the choices that they made. 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 30 says, uh, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. See, Paul is speaking about the Lord's Supper and those who come flippantly to the Lord's table. Those that are sick, those that are weak, those that have made poor choices. And Paul says there are some that are sick and have literally died because of their sinfulness, the choices that they have made. And oftentimes in life we make poor choices at times with our bodies. Obviously, this is the temple, and we're to take care of this. This is just the shell. We do have a soul, as we all know. However, I believe it's important that we do take care of our bodies, and some people abuse their bodies um, by certain means. Um, But also, we know that we should take care of ourselves as much as we can. So some sickness comes because of our failures, but also sickness can be caused by the enemy. See, Satan can attack our physical body. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 10, verse number 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. See, Satan can use sickness to cause us to doubt God's love for us. See, if you're in the midst of going through some difficult illness and something's going on in your life and it's really crippled you and it's really just hurt you, Satan can use that and he can use lies to try to deceive you into believing that God doesn't love you is the reason why this is going on in your life. He can say God doesn't care about you Or he would heal you. He would do something about that. And we know Satan is the author of lies and we should never listen to him because all he wants to do is to deceive you and to tear you up and to destroy you. But then also we see here some sicknesses are created for our good by our Father. Now this is another difficult one, but there's a reason behind it. See, some sicknesses come from God. And why would some sicknesses come from God? Being sick like nothing else gets us to refocus, I believe at times, our eyes on the Lord. That's not easy. It's not easy to do. See, sickness can deepen our fellowship with our Savior. Sickness can strengthen our faith. And it can also strengthen the faith of others because they see how we handle our circumstances when we're sick. When they see us remain positive through something very difficult going on, that encourages people. I'll never forget a pastor that I grew up under. He, very early, he was late 20s, early 30s, back in 1998, I believe. I was a senior in high school, and he found out he had a brain tumor. He was pastor in our church that I was at. Um, Went through a lot. Went through a lot of difficulties. Um, Sometimes he'd come up to preach. He would still come up to preach even after he had the surgery. At times he would, you could tell he lost his train of thought. It was very difficult sometimes to follow him. Um, He loved the Lord, but he still wanted to do what God called him to do. Still worked a full-time job at the same time. At a place over there. You know for some people. May have given up. May have just said I can't do this. But see through him. He was an inspiration for me. I was just young at the time. I was a young man. High school age. He had a great impact upon my life. And I'll never forget him. 
He was just a wonderful, wonderful inspiration. But see, we need people like that when they go through circumstances to be an inspiration to others. And that's very key and that's very important. But sickness deepens our fellowship with our Savior. It strengthens our faith. It can also strengthen the faith of others. Do you remember the story of the blind man who came to Jesus in John chapter number 9? Interesting story there. The disciples asked Jesus this question. Who sinned? This man or his parents? Who was the one that sinned? And Jesus answered them and said this. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. His blindness was caused so that the works of my father could be displayed in him. That's very powerful. Very powerful. See, God brings these things into our lives for a reason. Do I know the answer of why certain people are chosen over others? I don't really have the answer for that. I don't. Because I'm not God. But God knows and he has his purpose and his plan and he works this out through the people that have this. So first of all, we see here tonight, sickness always depends on the plan of God. And then number two, sickness never defeats the power of God. Look back at verse number 14 here. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, the word sick in verse number 14 means this, without strength or dying. That's what it means, literally. Um, this sickness James is speaking about wasn't someone that just had a little <coughs> cough. No. This isn't someone that just said, bring me a little cloth over my head. I f I'm a little hot. I just don't feel good today. No, that's not what he's talking about. James is describing those who are literally on the brink of death. Who are in a very serious situation. That's who he's speaking about. How should a person respond when someone they love is on the brink of death? Boy, that's hard, isn't it? When you know someone that is close to death. They've been through a lot. They've hurt. They've been through some type of illness and it's just taken a toll on their body and I've seen some people that were once very just alive and and were active and then once something takes a hold of their body it just completely takes all of them out all of that out of them and it's sad to see that I've seen many many instances where that has happened but as we think about this I think first of all We've got to yearn for the will of God above everything else. See, in verse number 14, James says, If someone is without strength and, and, and sick, the elders of the church ought to come out and pray for them and seek God for his will for that person's life. Now, notice this. It is the sick person who's to call for the elders. See, it's not the elders are supposed to go and search and bring them up in front of everybody and put them here and say, listen, this person's sick this morning. We're going to have an authentic healing. We're going to get this person taken care of today to draw attention to them. No, that's not what he's saying here. It isn't up to the faith healers to show up and touch someone, heal them, and do everything right. And secondly, it isn't up to the elders of the church just to show up when someone is sick. I don't know how many times this may be something here with some people I, I don't know I'm getting to know you all and I'm thankful for that and I haven't gotten to know everybody in great detail yet um, but I don't know how many times over my ministry that I have heard of people who have gotten upset because they haven't been visited by somebody in the church when they've been sick but let me say this if you're sick and you don't tell anybody <laughs> you don't tell anybody about it. You don't post anything about it. You don't make it known to anyone else, but yourself is the only one that knows. You can't get mad at anybody else because we're not mind readers. 
I remember there was a lady that would get do that often. And she would get upset because people wouldn't come to see her. And it wasn't that people knew she was there and she came, but if she had something going on like a little minor surgery, she'd get upset. And we're thinking, well, we can't do anything about something that we don't know. But speaking of faith healers, James is referencing those times of prayers over sick people as it to taking place in the privacy of one's home, not a healing service. I don't see where a healing service is needed. If someone calls for the elders of the church and calls for people to come pray with that individual, that should be in the privacy of their home. Why does this take place in the privacy of one's home? It's because we don't know if it is God's will or not for them to be healed. I'm not God. You're not God. And we cannot say you're going to be healed because we don't know. Now, we can go praying, believing that God can heal that individual. I believe that when people request prayer for something serious, we ought to pray, believing that God can do it. Because if you just pray this little wimpy prayer and just say, oh, but you don't believe it. See, when you pray, you got to believe what you pray. That's important. But in this verse, James is referencing to those who seek God's will in the sickness. See, think about this just for a moment. What would happen if there was a big healing service and this phony preacher had all these people come down here and had them all lined up one after another and they all come off the stage and not a one of them was healed? I'd be embarrassed. I wouldn't want that to happen. But if I go into a home and the person's requested it and I've prayed with them, with other people standing with me, I say, Father, we're praying for a healing, but like Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. And so that's the way we have to pray about it. But also yield to the work of God. Verse number 14 here again. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Oil, what oil? Castor oil, motor oil, what type of oil are we talking about here? Anointing oil. Now I want to read this to you because this is important for us to recognize about what oil, the anointing oil, rec- it means in the Bible. Anointing oil mentioned is mentioned 20 times in scripture was used in the old testament for pouring on the head of the high priest and his descendants and sprinkling the tabernacle and its furnishings to mark them as holy and to set apart um, to the lord this is found in exodus leviticus and numbers that's a little background here about the oil but also three times it is called the holy anointing oil And the Jews were strictly forbidden from reproducing it for personal use. Now, this goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. Now, the recipe for anointing oil is found in Exodus 30, verses 23 through 24. I'm not going to read to you all these verses, but I'm just giving you background on what is found here. It contains some things. It contained myrrh, cinnamon. I love cinnamon, by the way. I was writing that, and I was getting a little hungry thinking about that. (laughs) And other natural ingredients. Um, There is no indication that the oil or the ingredients had any supernatural power whatsoever. Rather, the strictness of the guidelines for creating the oil was a test of the obedience of the Israelites and a demonstration of the absolute holiness of God. So that's just a little bit of background information about the anointing oil and what it meant. Now, only five New Testament passages refer to the practice of anointing oil, and none of them offer an explanation for its use, however. We can draw our conclusions from context. In Matthew 5, or Matthew 6, 17, Jesus mentions the everyday practice of anointing oneself with oil. In Mark 6, 13, the disciples anoint the sick and heal them. In Mark 14, verses 3 through 9, Mary anoints Jesus' feet as an act of worship. 
And then in James 5.14, which we're talking about here tonight, the church elders anoint the sick with oil for healing. And then in Hebrews 1, 8 through 9, God says to Christ as he returns triumphantly to heaven, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and a God anoints Jesus with the oil of gladness. So those are some oil references that we see in the Old Testament and what it meant, but then also so what we see here in the New Testament. Now, with this oil business, sometimes we want to stay as far away as we can from it because we don't like talking about it. We don't. There are certain things that the Bible that we just often try to not talk about a lot. Do you know why? It's because sometimes we get scared to talk about it. Because we think, well, it's over our heads. We just don't really know that much about it. But in all reality, if you study, you'll find out that there is explanations for things. Now, some things we won't know until one day we're in glory. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm ready to ask some of the questions. I'm ready to hear an explanation because it'll all be revealed to us. We see through a glass that dimly, but one day it'll be crystal clear and we'll see it all. But I believe there are four different views for oil that we find in the scriptures. Three of them are false and one of them is accurate. All right, so let's go with those. I got those up here on the screen. Oil, what oil? First of all, the oil was used for a medicinal use. It was a type of medicine. Knowing the extremeness of the illness James is referring to, this could not have been the case. And some people see it this way. Number two, some say this oil was a vehicle of divine healing. It is a channel in which the grace of God heals. If a person needs grace to heal them, Jesus has plenty of it and doesn't need oil, magic, or some voodoo doctor to heal anyone because... His grace is sufficient. Number three, the oil is used to cleanse sins and purify the soul for death. Again, the only thing that purifies a soul is the blood of Jesus. That's what it's all about. Fourthly, and I believe this is the most accurate to our knowledge, is that the oil is symbolic to the spirit and a person's yielding to his work. The outward presence of oil is a visible presence of the inward work of God, so the use of oil is a picture of someone yielding to God working in their life. I believe that's the most accurate, to my knowledge, of what the oil actually represents. Because when someone comes in, I've never been a part of this before. I'll, I'll just be up front with you tonight. Never participated in it. Heard of it. It's just like this. Foot washing service. Never participated in one of those. I don't know if I'd want to. I don't know if I want to take people's shoes off and their socks. I don't know about that one. But see, when Jesus was talking about washing people's feet, if you understand that culture, that was lowering yourself to the lowest of low in an act of a servant. You can be a servant without washing somebody's feet. That was just an example. So that's very important. But when you come in and you surround this person with oil, that oil within itself doesn't do anything. It is when the person yields to the Spirit and believes, and then you have those people surrounding them in prayer, when they come together praying, acknowledging that it's all you, God. If you want to heal this person, you will. But if it's not in thy will, you won't. And uh, once again, that's hard because some are healed and some aren't. And one, we'll never know the answer to that until one day. Uh, but let's look at this. Thirdly, sickness often displays the praise of God. So up until this point, James has focused on those times that God doesn't heal. Now he shifts to those miraculous times that God does heal. Have you experienced someone that has went through something difficult and you've prayed and miraculously it's gone it's like with Harold remember what happened with him he went in and they were thinking they were going to have to do all this stuff and he was going to be out of commission for a long time went in there that doctor looked in there those nurses and they looked up and they said wait a minute we're not seeing what we thought we were supposed to see and as soon as they realized that and I got that message I was just like to God be the glory because the things that man thinks 
should happen are not the way God sees it. And so that was just a miraculous thing. But here we see James shows the power, uh, or excuse me, James shows the prayer of faith. Verse number 15 here again. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Now this statement would be easier to accept if it said, shall sometimes save the sick. But that isn't what it says. It says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. So, here is the issue. If I pray for someone to be healed, and I mean it, and I believe it with all my heart, and they aren't, sa- and they aren't healed, does that mean I don't have enough faith? Okay. Paul prayed for the sick and we see that some of them were not healed. Did that mean that Paul was a lesser Christian? Well, of course not. I'm going to read this to you and this story. Actually, I, sent, I, was, I was reading one of my commentaries today and I don't think I'd ever came across this before in this one specific one. But I shared it with her and, and I'm going to read this to you because this actually applied in our life recently with here with Titus and what he went through with his eyes. But listen to this. Um, John Phillips is a commentator. He's gone on to be with the Lord. He did a series, and it never was complete. Um, excellent commentator, very conservative in his um, research. But John Phillips tells the story of his second daughter and how that when she was born, they discovered that hey, she had a severe cross to one eye. Excuse me. At the time, they were living in a remote town, away from a lot of things, away from many people, and had no access to a professional. So they had nowhere to go. They had just started a new church, and a lot of great things were happening. It was a church start, and they appreciated that there was a resident missionary who was in town, and he was a very respectable individual, loved the Lord, and who was also very well doused in the word. And, and he was an excellent soul winner. So one day they approached him and they said, listen, we have our daughter here and we don't know what to do. And we don't have anybody to go to. We've been praying and ask him his thoughts. And he said, well, have you considered this passage, the one that we've just read here this evening? They said, yes, I know that passage of Scripture. And he said, well, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's get some men together. We'll get the anointing oil. We'll go in there, and we will pray that she is healed. Well, they accepted the counsel and went through the process, did everything. Well, after it was over, still had the cross. I thought, well, maybe later on something will happen. That morning got up, the cross was still there. The eye was still crossed. Waited a couple of days. The eye was still crossed. Then waited a week, a little longer, still was there. So John then stated that two things happened. First of all, he heard of an ophthalmologist about 500 miles away who specialized in this problem area. The doctor said it was a common problem. He said, wait until um, the, ch- the child is two, then bring her back and we will fix the problem. And that's what he did. And the Lord used him to fix it. And it did. It corrected her vision. Secondly, he realized that I could not depend upon secondhand theology. I'm going to explain what that means here in a moment. I needed to do my own hermeneutics and exegesis. It became obvious to him that the passage in James did not say what my teacher evangelist friend said it said. Others, the Lord would have performed the requested miracle. Evidently, this much abused passage is not a blanket prescription for healing. Then he said he also learned that this kind of teaching to which I had listened and raised False hopes that as often as not ended in disappointment. It also led to self-incrimination. Maybe he thought, I am at fault for not having enough faith that my daughter was healed. 
And see, we have various people today that will tell people, you're not healed because of your faith. And they're led astray by that. And I've heard people say this before that it brought people in praying, is that they're not healed because of your faith, and that's what, what he's saying. And that infuriates me at times about that. Listen, when you hear someone tell you what you perceive to be truth, don't take secondhand theology. Don't just take someone's word for something about what they have to say about the Bible. Study to show thyself approved. Study for yourself the word. Practice hermeneutics. Hermeneutics means you exegete the passage and you pull that out for your own understanding. Don't allow someone just to feed you something. You, yourself, you look to the scriptures and you examine to see if it will hold up underneath scrutiny. Remember, I preached about that once. It's what someone says, hold it accountable side by side with the word of God. And if it doesn't hold up, you get away from them because you don't need to listen to that. See, a favorite cop-out of healers when their gimmicks fail is that it was the person's fault. They'll start blaming. They'll start pointing the fingers. So here is the question. What is the prayer of faith? That James is talking about here. It is more than crossing our fingers and hoping that something miraculous happens. And hoping it is more than hopes and dreams. The prayer that gets to heaven is the prayer that starts in heaven. If God wants to heal, he will give us the faith we need to pray over the sick person. And they will be healed. Because I believe that if God wants them healed, they'll be healed. Then, when he gives that faith, we become spectators and we have a front row seat to a miracle of God that's happening. And I still believe he performs miracles every day. You look at a life change, that's a miracle. But see, we also see here the pardon of faith. Verse number 15 again. If he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. As James wraps up this thought on healing, he ends it by saying the healing of sins is more important than the healing of the body. So that's very important for us to recognize. See, when God heals someone's heart disease, pray for that, or, or praise God for that. However, did you know that one day, that heart will one day stop beating again because it's, your heart isn't e eternal. Your soul's eternal, but your heart, your body is not eternal. God heals someone of cancer. Praise the Lord for that. However, one day death will eventually come once again. See, all physical healing is only temporal. If God heals our sin problem, that's a great thing because then we can live forever because that's the thing that needs healing is that so with that being said this is a passage that talked about debated discussed but i thought that was very powerful because oftentimes people will just believe anything from anybody but don't take secondhand theology study for yourself anybody got any comments about that it was a lot but Yeah. And also some of these that claim that, why not go to the hospital and just go room to room? <laughs> Clean the hospitals out. Put the hospitals out of business. Because if you have that so much, if you have that much power, clean the hospitals out. I mean, take care of everybody.
Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. that when it's someone that you love dearly that's a hard thing to pray because we are I I think back to John chapter 11 I did a paper on that a long time ago back when I was in college not not seminary but in college and I did a paper on that John 11 verse 1 through 44 obviously and um, Jesus when he came, it says he wept, and I believe that he earnestly saw Mary and Martha, and that's why he wept, because he saw their sadness. Yeah, he saw their sadness, and and I think that when he did that, um, that showed the compassion of the Savior. Yeah. Mhm. Yeah. 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 a once again that's a it's a it's a hard thing because we are we we are fallible individuals because we have mistakes we have feelings and sometimes we let our feelings emotions get the best of us and sometimes negative ways when we get upset about stuff but also at the same time I think that God sees that and I, th- I have a quote somewhere, and I can't remember, and it, it goes a lot like this. I may be paraphrasing it, but it says, The tears that we cry in the harshest of situations are the tears that nourishes us most to God because those tears are help nourish us, and it really makes an impact on our life for how that we grow in the Lord. And through those difficult times, you grow. Because when my mom died, that was a year of her having a tumor, and we had a lot of time to grieve because we knew it was coming. The doctor said one year, and it was a year. And so through that time, um, I did a lot of mourning, and and I was ready the best of the ability. I mean, you're never going to be perfectly ready for a loved one to pass, but um, I just know during that time I grew a lot and as a person but also in my faith. And when things happen to us, there's always a purpose 
And when we go through things, Romans 8, 28 through 30, we all know that those things that happen in our life are God's working it out, paraphrasing once again here. But then if you go on into the next part of that verse, everything we go through is to conform us more to the image of Jesus. And we have to remember that, and that's hard. Because everything we face, everything we go through is a conforming to the image of Jesus. Because that should be our striving factor in life is to be more like him. And so it's very important to recognize. But good stuff here, though, because those are questions that not just we as Christians ask, but that's what the culture asks. Why do these people have to die and then these don't? And so that's been a question as long as time has been here with man and woman that have been on this earth. That question has been asked. So, It's okay. Hey, my my mom, this fall, she'll be gone 20 years, and I, I still cry a lot because I tell you, I, I get emotional on Mother's Day because uh, I always tell people, if you've still got your mom with her, hug her neck, love her, because you never know when you won't have her anymore. And a mother's love is second only to the father, and I think that um, it's amazing just that connection that's there. Yeah, it's a. It's hard. Anyone else have something they thought of while we were talking about that? It's been good to be here tonight, and I know this is a hard passage to talk about because uh, obviously there's some various views, but uh, I believe in prayer, and uh, I believe people coming together. When you pray, you mean it, and like I said earlier, and I'll close with this, is that when we pray, we ought to pray believing God will do it, and uh, I've always believed that, and I prayed that when my mom was sick. But also at the same time, I knew that if it wasn't his will, that I'd see her again. Because it's never a goodbye. I never mention at a funeral that it's goodbye. Because when I tell you goodbye, I'm never going to see you again. Pastor always sh- shared with us many years, many years ago. He said, it's only goodnight because morning's coming. And 
you'll see him again. Never say goodbye because you'll see him again. Good, isn't it? All right, anybody else before we pray? A couple of things to be mindful of. We still got our cards here to hand out for Easter. Several of these up here. And uh, go ahead and jump on this too. You got one week left to invite people to come. So better get busy if you haven't been inviting anybody. <laughs> Working on that. We're going to get them here on April the 10th. All right. We're going to pack this place out. Have a good day. Worshiping the Lord. Food. Go out and those kids are going to be running everywhere. Hiding those eggs and so uh, just to be a good time in the Lord that day. So keep that in mind. Then following week Easter and just a lot to be going on. So keep all these things in mind. And um, there's something else here, Spring Revival. If you want to check out the information here, I saw this up here when I got here. It's coming up April 3rd, Liberty Baptist Church. I think that's down the road, isn't it, a little ways? So um, if you're interested in going to that, that's April um, the 3rd through the 6th. That's 6 p.m. nightly. But it's been good to be here. Pray for Sunday. Pray that... Um, We'll have a good time in the Lord and that he'll be exalted in all things that we do. Let's go ahead and let's bow. We'll pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this time together. Um, good talk tonight as we have looked at the scriptures. We've studied them. We've shared personal examples in our own lives. And we thank you, Father, for this time just to reflect upon your word. We love you. We pray for safety tonight as we travel home. Look forward to being back again this Sunday morning. And we thank you so much for all you do. You're a marvelous, wonderful God. And thank you for the perfect gift of salvation that is through Jesus. And ask this in his name. Amen. Um, the church that I pastored at, previous to the previous church, when we were there, that church, I was just there a year, They, they, we joined that church, but they never sent for our letter from that other church. So... It's okay. We'll just do it like that because I don't know. I don't know if the other church has or the other.